Hello, I'm Rob Hassett. I'm an attorney in Atlanta in uh, corporate technology and entertainment law, and I own and operate the internetlegal.com website. And uh, this is part of my programs that I'm putting together that I call Surprising Answers to Important Legal Questions. Both the first program I did last week and the second program, this one, are uh, about, about trademark law. So that both of them right now are about trademark law. It'd be good to look at the first one if you haven't seen it <clears throat> then before watching this one. First, I'm going to talk about the advantages of registration in the USPTO. First advantage is when you file, when you've registered a mark in the USPTO, which takes 10 months to maybe three years or more, once it's registered, it creates presumption that you have rights throughout the United States as of the date you file. And that's valuable going to court because that puts the burden on the other party to prove that you don't have the rights. And it shows something that causes you not to have the rights that you can then rebut if you can. Second, it actually creates ownership of the mark everywhere in the U.S. when no one else has applied and there was not a prior user of a similar mark for related products or services. So you can see that's a significant advantage. You actually gain rights in, in territory by registering the mark, and you can register before you use the mark. It's called an intent to use. And if you get the registration, your rights relate back to the day you filed. Third reason, it greatly enhances the ability to fight um, importation of uh, counterfeit marks. And it, well, you can get up to $2 million, the court can award up to $2 million per counterfeit mark, per type of good or service sold, offered for sale or distributed. The court doesn't have to do that, but it puts them in a the, the defendant at quite a risk. Finally, and I think this is a surprise, most people wouldn't know this, most lawyers probably don't know this, it permits the sale of what would otherwise constitute a business opportunity of franchises. If you've got a franchise and you have a registered mark, you can avoid a lot of the state business opportunity laws. That you can avoid them. In. I don't know about every state you can avoid them in, but I know this is true in Georgia. True in Connecticut, I remember that. It's true in North Carolina and South Carolina. So, so that's another good reason to register. Now we're going to get into the more nitty gritty. What is required to register a trademark or service mark in the USPTO? Now, what's required to register is based in part on how distinctive your mark is, how inherently distinctive it is. By inherently distinctive, I mean of the day that it, you first use it or apply to register it. <clears throat> how distinct is it? And there's five degrees, categories of marks. Some of these, it's hard to tell whether what slot it goes in, but that's true in a lot of legal areas. We have to predict and guess as best we can. The first of the five categories is generic. Examples of that category are the band in the yellow pages. Something's generic. It's too gen general to register. As long as it stays generic, which it could stay generic forever, it can never be registered. It cannot be registered. Second, the mark could be descriptive. And here are some examples of descriptive marks: buffered for buffered aspirin. Descriptive means it describes some aspect of the product or service. Now, descriptive marks can only um, become distinctive by uh, use or promotion or something like that. The USPTO will presume that after five years of use. 
a mark has become this, a descriptive mark has become distinctive and may be registered. It can be registered earlier than that if you can show that by advertising, viral marketing, or in some other way, the mark has become uh, distinctive on its own before the fi five years are up. And ways you can prove that are by showing articles in the media, lots of sales, lots of advertising, that sort of thing. You know, a mark that, that is suggestive is one that implies that um, it doesn't describe any any aspect of a product or service, but it it, it creates some implication of what it might be. If a mark is suggestive, it's considered to be inherently distinctive, and you don't have to it doesn't you don't have to wait for it to be distinctive to apply to register your mark. That's even more true if it's arbitrary or fanciful. <clears throat> Here are some marks, arbitrary or ordinary words that have no descriptive connection to the product or service. Fanciful or made up. So assuming your mark is distinctive, what is required to register that mark in the USPTO? Well, if it's a trademark, you have to, well, either way, you have to be using the mark in interstate commerce as defined by the USPTO. If it's, the, if it's a trademark, that means you're selling goods with that trademark in commerce, which means you're selling to other states, shipping to other states, and shipping to other countries. If it's a service mark, you need to be providing the services either to people in other states or other countries, or you can be providing the services to people that are from other states in other countries. I think this is surprising. You can, um, if you have a restaurant on an interstate highway or near a hotel that has out-of-town guests, you probably qualify for interstate commerce under this rule. Now, what do you need to provide the USPTO? Well, let me tell you that you can apply it to two different kinds of registration, intent to use, which means you intend to use in the future, and marks that are already being used. Either way, you have to use the mark in commerce before you can actually get it registered. With intent to use, you just prove that later, and you're, either way, you're Get a registration, your date of registration relates back to when you file. And that establishes your priorities. So what do you do? You need to show that you're using the mark in commerce, and to do that you have to provide specimens. And there is a difference between what you provide for trademarks and service marks. If it's a trademark, then you show a label on the goods or a photograph of a label on the goods showing the mark on the on label to the goods, or on the goods, or on packaging for the goods, or on display for the goods. If the service mark, you need to show uh, some sort of promotional material describing the service with and showing the mark. Advertising works, websites, flyers work, that's what you need for that. So what are the lessons I want you to take away from this today? First, always try to pick a mark that is not generic or descriptive. You want one that's distinctive so you can immediately work, work to protect it. Two, you need to pick a mark that's not the same as or similar to another mark that has been used for the same or similar goods or services in the U.S. before you used it. And finally, that you don't pick a mark that's already registered, that somebody's already applied to register, for, that's, or that's similar to one that's already been applied for, for, for the sale of the same or similar goods or services in the U.S. And as I always do, I'm finishing with a disclaimer. The uh, 
I, I put this information on the internet to help my clients and the clients of other lawyers to understand what's going on with and involved with trademarks and service marks and why they need to be people need to be very uh, careful if they're registering a, or they're trying to protect a mark that this their brand that's real important to them. If it's not important, you don't need a lawyer. Don't need to worry about it, but there are many exceptions to what I've said today, based on different fact patterns. And so, you, I urge you to have an attorney if you're trying to protect something important. Thanks.